Sarah. Hi, How's Casey. It going? Good. How are you? Good. Um, welcome back, everybody. Glad that you could make it. Um, it won't be released on the same day, but I feel like we have to call it out that we are filming on Casey's birthday. Happy birthday, Casey. Yeah, I will not disclose how old I am. <laughs> Hopefully you too get many to numbers. Some... What? Big numbers. Too many numbers. Yeah. Get out, it's too many numbers. Um, anyway, so I'm I'm glad that you took time out to film today. It's exciting. Yeah. Um so I today... love talking about knitting. Yeah. <laughs> A little bit about anything. Um, today we're going to talk about gauge. It's like a it's like a bad word, kind of. <laughs> I feel like for a lot of people, um, gauge seems to be a really un hot commodity kind of topic. Um, and kind of scary. Kind of scary, but but it's not. It's not that not scary really that when scary. you figure it out. And really important if you're knitting garments. Um, so. We kind of have a lot to say about it, I think. So maybe we should just jump in. Um, yeah. So what is it? What is Gage? So <laughs> I think really briefly put, as many of you probably know, Gage is basically just saying how many stitches per inch, right? Like that's that's like the very base level explanation is like how many stitches of knitting per inch. Now, a designer usually tends to um, say over four inches because you just have a little bit better estimate of how, you know, how many stitches you have over a four inch swatch versus just like a tiny inch. Um, and lots of things determine what your gauge is gonna be like, right? So your needle size obviously is a big one. Your yarn, what kind of yarn you're using and what the plumpness of your yarn is um, in addition to sort of what weight it is, right? Because <clears throat> we know that different yarns at the same weight can still be different levels of thicknesses, right? Um, your tension. So tension for newer knitters is how hard you're pulling on the yarn as you make each stitch. So for some people, tension is really tight. For some people, it's very loose. I would say most of us are somewhere in between those two extremes, right? I know that when I started knitting, I felt like mine was too loose and it's kind of tightened up over time. Um, I do, there was a friend of mine who learned how to knit whose tension was so tight when she started because she was like, yeah, you know, trying to get the stitches in that um, she couldn't slide the stitches along her needle when she was learning. So that was really tricky for her. So tension is something that um, everyone kind of falls into naturally. I feel like you kind of develop your tension as you get comfortable with what your hold is going to be on the needles. Would you say that's true? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, gauge is important in garments because it's gonna determine what the size of your garment is, right? So if, uh, if the designer says that you're supposed to have 20 stitches per four inches and you only have 18 or you have 25, those extra stitches one way or the other are gonna make your garment too big or too small. And then you're gonna be sad mm -hmm. <laughs> when you get yep. to the end. So. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I hate swatching. I hate swatching. Uh, but I do it in most cases. I was like 99% of the time I swatch. Well, and you know, a lot of people when I, you know, when I was a newer knitter and I admitted that I didn't swatch, it was like, it was like a sin in the knitting world. And, and, you know, that I got many lectures, but I mean, it, it makes sense now as a knitter, like there, you know, the point being like, you're going to spend a month on this thing and how much money on this yarn and you don't care if it's going to fit you in a way that looks nice and comfortable, like it matters, right? So if it takes you 30 minutes or an hour to swatch, right, isn't it worth it? Um, because you're going to invest so much of your time into this thing that you might never wear. So, so now I swatch. Yeah, almost every time. And I think that just knowing how to swatch and how to manipulate the pattern if your swatch doesn't match the gauge is helpful in not being so frustrated with your knitting, right? Because I mm -hmm. definitely know people who say, oh, I've made a sweater. I've even made two sweaters, but like neither of them really fit me that great. And I don't know what I did wrong, but now I just don't want to do it, you know? And so, and I totally understand that frustration because you know, as you said, like you're going to put a month or more's worth of work into a garment, you want it to fit the way that you expect it to fit, right? 
So swatching, let's talk about swatching because swatching has, I feel like lots of little facets to it. Casey lately has been swatching a ton <laughs> for all these projects mm -hmm. because the gauge hasn't been turning out so happy. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, uh, I've been using a lot of yarn. Like I almost used up a whole skein of yarn trying to knit my dad or to figure out what size to knit my dad's cardigan for Father's Day. Um, and then I feel like knitting for, for dudes is a challenge too. Cause I had to swatch twice for Jake's hoodie that I'm knitting too. And I have some swatch examples, but, um, gosh, like the design. So, so gauge being just the designer's tension with the yarn that they use, that's what gauge is. It's a, it's not an objective number. Every pattern is different because you are basically trying to mimic the tension of the designer to, you know, um, because that's how they draw up their sizing and all, they do all the math based on that initial gauge, which is their own. Um, and so, uh, you know, I was swatching for the, the uh, Montrealer hoodie for my husband for his birthday present. And uh, he wanted 20 stitches per four inches in DK weight yarn. Um, I'm substituting yarn. So we need to talk about substituting yarn. Um, I'm not using the yarn that he used. Um, I'm using a, you know, a DK weight in a color, in a colorway that my husband likes. Um, and I swatched in the correct needles sizes, you know, size seven needles. And I was way off. I only got 16 stitches per four inches um, when it called for 20. So what that meant was that I was knitting you know, much looser than the designer did, right? He was getting four more inch, more, four more stitches into that four inches than I could, meaning that he was knitting much tighter than I was. And so what I had to do then was then go down a needle size, but I already knew before I even swatched again, I knew that one size down was not gonna be enough to make up for four stitches. I was four stitches off. So I went down two needle sizes and I still, it didn't work. I, I knit in size five needle and then I got 18 stitches for four inches. So I was still two stitches off. And you think, oh, two stitches off, that's nothing. But a sweater's not four inches, right? So yeah. when you're knitting, when your chest circumference or bust circumference, whatever, um, is how many stitches, hundreds of stitches, right? So it's, it's much more than four inches. So if, even though it's two inches off, it over, over the whole circumference of the garment is quite a lot. And so um, I ended up you know, doing the math. So basically I took, after you divide the sleeves for the sweater and you look at the stitches the, um, that you have on the needle for the chest, for the body, when you're just knitting in the round for the body, I divided that by my, my gauge, my stitch per inch. And that gave me my final chest measurement for him, for my husband, right? And if he's a size four, if he wants a size 44 chest, I was at like a 54. So that's like 10 extra inches of ease. And my husband's kind of vain and he wants a very fitted, a very nice hoodie. <laughs> and I knew that he didn't want a big sack, like a really baggy, sweater to wear so I'm like I don't know what to do so going two needle sizes down wasn't enough so what I had to also do was the math to figure out I'm also going to have to go down a chest size down as well better. and continue with the smaller needles yeah and then that and that'll get me roughly I mean pretty Rewind. pretty accurately close but it's a lot. It's a lot of things that you want to think about before you just jump in and invest all that time and energy into a sweater. I feel like I've been talking a lot, so I'll let you jump in for a bit. <laughs> that was good. I mean, that's, I think that's exactly the journey that sometimes has to get taken and you'll find that there's designers who knit just like you do or very close to how you personally knit and mm -hmm. you don't have to change things. You know, you swatch for them, like there's designers where I've made enough sweaters or enough garments from them that like, I, I don't, those are the people that I don't swatch for anymore. Cause I'm always on gauge and I just like, I just know that we knit similarly. Right. And then every time I have a new designer that I'm working for or 
her test or a new pattern, new designer that I've picked up a pattern from always have to swatch, right? Because you don't ever know what's normal. Like what's my normal is not anyone else's normal necessarily, right? So I think with swatching, um, things to remember, you definitely need to make your swatch bigger than what it says. So if it tells you it's 20 stitches per four inches, you need to cast on more than 20 stitches. You need to be able to actually see that 20 stitches over the four inches. So for me, I usually do a buffer of like two stitches on either side and then a border. I like to put a border on. Controversial. There's definitely people that say don't put a border on because it alters the middle piece of your fabric. I've never experienced it altering the middle piece of my fabric, like the piece that's got the stitch in it. Because remember, you're not always gauge swatching in stockinette or garter. You could be doing a fancy stitch and that's what they want you to swatch in. The, the pattern should always tell you like mm -hmm. 20 stitches over four inches in stockinette, in garter stitch, in granite stitch, in whatever. Uh, so there's, there's, there's some controversy about if you put a border on or if you don't, but, um, if I don't put a border on, I'm definitely probably buffering five stitches on each side of whatever the gauge is. So if the gauge is 20, I'm casting on, you know, 30. Um, and then there's row gauge. So row gauge is also usually listed out. I feel like a lot of times people don't pay as much attention to row gauge, but it gets to be really important when you're doing things like yoke depth of a sweater. So the yoke is how far from the underarm, like from here to here, this is the yoke depth. This sweater, um, I can talk more about it later, but the reason I wore it is because it was a test knit where I didn't listen to myself. I always knit the same as this designer. I gauge swatched. I didn't, I, I paid attention to my swatch instead of my brain, which I should not have done. And I'm a fairly tight knitter. So if anything, I usually have to go up in needle sizes, right? Um, excuse me, but for uh, for this particular designer, I don't usually have to do that. And when I swatched for this, my swatch suggested that maybe I should go up in needle size. But I thought, ah, oh, that's not a really bad idea. And I did it anyway, and I didn't pay attention to the row gauge. And what happened was that this, which is supposed to be more of a fitted sweater, is now more like a swancho. As you can see, it's very oversized. My armpit is up here. <laughs> so it's like massively, the yoke is massively longer before the underarm, uh, you know, before you split for the sleeves, then it should have been like massively. And because of that, of course, I had to alter um, the sleeves as well. I had to make them come in much faster so that it, it wasn't like a total disaster. Now, I mean, does this, do I wear this sweater? Yes, I still wear it. It's like a fun baggy, like throw it on sweater. Is it what the pattern was supposed to be? No, right. So this was like an okay disaster, <laughs> but it doesn't, uh, you know, but if I was trying to knit that sweater, I think I would've been really frustrated. And I felt extra bad because of course I was testing since I'm addicted to test knits. And um, anyway, so that was, that's my story about gauge. Um, but row gauge does matter. Um, I think if, I mean, personally, if I'm off just a teeny bit, I don't, I'm okay with it. But like in this instance, I obviously was off by a lot and I should have paid more attention and figured out like, oh, I just need to stick with the other gauge or stick with the other gauge and change the size I'm going to make. You know, I should have done something more like that, but I didn't, which is a problem. So um, anyway, yeah. so as you're swatching, more stitches than is, is the recommended gauge is generally the convention. Uh, you want to make sure that you kind of make enough fabric. So looking at the row gauge, I often make as many rows as is on there or more, but I, you know, if I'm casting on 30, I like to go 30 by 30. Like I like to make it look pretty. I like a little square, right? Uh, you don't yeah. have to, I guess, but I think that's the, that tends to be the convention. You want to block your swatch if it's called for as a blocked swatch. So most of the time designers, when they give a gauge are talking about a blocked gauge, just like you would block your finished product. So if you're going to steam block it, steam block your swatch. If you're going to wet block it, wet block your swatch, right? And pin it out, not extreme, uh, unless it says to do that. <laughs> On a rare Just to prevent curling. Yeah, just to prevent right. curling. I usually put a pin in every corner just to prevent curling, but there are some patterns, like if you read ahead in the pattern, sometimes it says that you might have to aggressively block this for some something, something. And so then I try to mimic that with my swatches usually. Like if I'm gonna, if I know I'm gonna aggressively block the sweater, I try to aggressively block the swatch too. There are some designers and I love them so much <laughs> who will put an unblocked swatch gauge on there 
and a blocked swatch gauge on there. Um, the person in me who does not like to wait to block my swatch really likes that because I feel like sometimes if my unblocked swatch gauge is on, then that's like enough for me and I will just jump in anyway. Um, I don't well, know. Well, and you can save, you can save the yarn if it's unblocked, right? Because yeah. when you're knitting in the round, if you have to, if you're blocking it, you have to cut those, um, those big, uh, what's the word? It's just so, like the big loops in the back. Yeah. A, yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, but you don't have to cut it if you're not blocking it and then you can unravel it and use it. Which is true. It's true for a flat swatch as well, right? Like you don't have mm -hmm. to waste that yarn basically if you're not blocking it, which is nice. Uh, as you're blocking, when you go to read um, your stitches per inch, you want to use something hard. Casey just found I out know. Casey uses like a soft tape measure, um, which I mean works in a pinch, but technically you should on use a flat something, surface. Should do something hard, but and you should always you say you want to lay out your swatch on a flat surface, not still pinned, right? Unpin it, put on a flat surface, something hard. So I like this kind of thing. This is made by Katrinkles, but I think other companies make them. This is um, measured out at four inches and it's also got a centimeters in case you have a pattern that's in centimeters. But um, I like this because it's hard. You can just lay it straight down. And then I like to use the tip of my needle to count because mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard to lose track. But you just like, for me, I line this up right along the bottom of one of my rows and then I count, 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 you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. Um, so that's the best way to count your gauge. Now, hopefully it says 20 stitches, you get 20 stitches. That's like the dream, right? If you end up with more stitches per inch, so say it said 20 and you have 22, what that generally means is that your gauge is smaller, could be for a variety of reasons. So the reason your gauge could change could be for a variety of reasons, right? You could be knitting in this case tighter, so you could knit tighter than the designer. Your yarn, if you did yarn substitution, could just be different, could be less fluffy, could be, you know, so then it's making more room for stitches on, you know, so all of those kinds of things too. But basically, if you have more stitches than is called for, the stitches are smaller, more fit in there, right? Makes sense. And you need to go up in a needle size, potentially. The opposite is true if you have less stitches, right? If it calls for 20 stitches and you only have 18, then your stitches are plumper, they're bigger for some reason. Again, could be you knit looser than the designer, you could have plumper yarn if you substituted all of those things. Then you need to go down needle sizes, right? So that you're making, uh, stitches that are smaller. So that's sort of the, the general idea of swatching, which I'm sure many of you know. Swatching in the round. Do people do it? Do you do it? I do it. Yeah, I do. That's why all of them have some flair. Some flair. Some extra flair. Fringe, I guess. <laughs> so swatching in the round, if you don't know, um, your gauge is different when you knit something like stockinette in the round, right? Because stockinette flat is knitting across, flipping it over, purling back, right? And most people have different tension between their knitting and their purling stitches, just because it requires a different motion of your hands. Might not be that big, but it could be big enough to affect your gauge. When you knit in the round, when you knit stocking it in the round, it's just knitting, right? Knitting and knitting and knitting and knitting and knitting, right? And that's a different gauge. And so to swatch in the round, you uh, go across and then slide and as you what you do is you take your yarn and you just leave like a big loop in the back and then you come back to the front and you knit across again and then you slide then you have to do it on a circular needle and then mm -hmm. you leave a big loop in the back so this is what Casey's talking about when she's saying like if you don't have to block that then all those yarn loops that you're just like letting hang in the back it's kind of it's, sometimes it can add up to a bunch of yarn and then when you block it you have to cut all those and tie them off and they look cute and I think Casey has a do you have a swatch to show? Yeah. Well, Maybe yeah, I'll little, just show this one. It's got um, a little, a little, little fringe and I cut it really short, at, but not initially. Like this was just cause I wanted it to look like a cute little rug or something. But <laughs> notice that like um, on the edges and this is another reason why Sarah said cast on m more stitches than um, the, the gauge is supposed to be because not only um, do you, you know, you, you might, your tension might affect whether or not you meet those four inches 
you know, you know. but also um, notice that on the edges here about this, these first two stitches here are a little bit looser and wonkier than the nice tidy middle stitches, right? And that's because of that loop, that um, big um, float in big the back. Float. It's like one yeah. big float. And so um, when you cut it, you're, they're gonna be much longer than this, but you're gonna wanna like nice and carefully, you're gonna wanna pull one, you know, each one tight so that it kind of tidies this edge up because it's gonna look way worse than this does right now. Um, but then you kind of pull it and it kind of comes back together. And um, so it's kind of stressful when you're cutting it and you look at it and you're like, this doesn't look like a swatch. This looks terrible. But yeah, I yeah. agree. I, the first time I swatched in the round, I thought it was like a hot mess. All those, like the big long floats and then I didn't make them long enough. And then they were pulling, like it was such a mess. But I will say because I cast on more stitches than I needed, those stitches on the edges didn't matter so much and I could still get my gauge from the middle. Mm -hmm. which was good. And it's important to get uh, an in the round gauge if you're going to be knitting in the round because it does make a difference. So it's a good, it's a good thing to get in the habit of doing. And I'm the kind of person that prefers to knit a sweater in the round seamless versus like in panels that I have to sew up later. So I'm all about that. I'm in the middle of but. making a paneled sweater right now and it's not my favorite. <laughs> I mean, I, I love the way the finished product looks. It looks really tidy, but I'm also like lazy and I like the seamless, easy, easiness of a, in the round sweater, but. Yeah, I will say the one nice thing about panels is it's portable. It's way more portable. Oh, that is true. Like one piece and like one skein maybe at a time, right? So yeah. Sometimes you don't want to like Hulk my giant sweater in the round around. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, that's fair. But so panels does make it a lot more portable and there's, there is a certain satisfaction of being like, oh, I just cast off that part, you know, like that does feel nice, but uh, I'm, I just keep thinking about the, all the seaming and I'm like, oh, I'm but sure yeah. I would get better at it the more I did it, but it's yeah. one of those things, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to do some more seaming. It's, um, it's something I've shied away from just because I don't love, I, I sew on a machine, but I don't love hand sewing. And so I feel that same carry over here. Like I don't like mm -hmm. seaming things. I just don't feel like it's as strong when I do it. So I'm, I'm trying to pick up some projects like that so I can get better at it. Okay. So yeah. Should we um, talk a little bit about drape too? Because that's another thing that you get from a gauge swatch, not just the gauge. Um, really? So like, for example, I was so back to my husband's hoodie that I'm knitting, the Montrealer. Here's the deal. Trying to knit a DK weight sweater in size three needles, sure, that would get me to gauge like DK weight on size three needles is not fun. That's ooh, just ugh. and that would be really stiff, right? Really stiff. Yeah. So that's the, the drape piece too is like, so I have my, my swatch in size seven and look at this nice little, you can see the drape. See, it's nice and floppy, right? And then my size five, just a little tighter, just a little less, I don't know. What's the word? Just, just not as it's yeah. stiff. And I could show you, I could show you what it looks like. Where's my project bag here? It is not, it's not fun even in size fives. So. Cause you ended up doing it on fives, right? I did. And it's just, it's. it's and this is pre-blocked. Yeah, oh, that's not the right size to show you. Yeah, pre-blocked, right? Um, so, but it is stiff. You can kind of even hopefully see the stiffness of it, um, whatever. I mean, I, size five is manageable. It's not as fun with my fingers. It's not, it doesn't feel very good, um, but trying to do that on size three to get gauge, uh-uh, ain't gonna happen. So I, that's why I also decided to switch down to the, um, to the smaller chest size too. And I had to do a little math by looking at the stitches um, after sleeve separation 
and then dividing it by my stitches per inch number to get to what the chest measurement should be. Um, but another thing that you, sh you can think about with gauge is um, playing around with yarn weight. So for example, um, I'm going to eventually knit the Fonda sweater by Caitlin Hunter. I just think it's super cute and it's this nice little cropped short sleeve design with bobbles and I've never done bobbles before. So I really, really wanna do that. And uh, the Westerly shawl. Those are my two little bobbly yep. patterns oh, in, the, in the queue. Um, but I was able to get gauge for the Fonda sweater in sport weight yarn. And I think that's a really great thing because um, I wanna use this like really tweedy, tweedy wooly wool. And, you know, it's got this really nice floppy drape here going on. And I feel like for a summer crop, you don't want a really heavy, bobbly thick garment, you know, you know, I live in Washington state and it's still muggy and hot and I, I wouldn't <laughs> be wearing that much unless I had a long sleeve or something underneath it um, in the winter time. But um, so I think sometimes you can mess with the yarn weight a little bit to give you more of that like drapey, if maybe you want more drape than the pattern is calling for, right? And um, another example, Sarah, you're knitting the pressed flower shawl for our, for our hey. cow um, and you're, you're using sport weight yarn instead of DK. Yep. Or calls for DK, right? No, yep. I, should, I should remember this. Yeah, okay. Um, but so it's not, just, it's not just about the gauge, it's about drape too. And so if you are just going up needle sizes and swatching and swatching until you get gauge, that's also, I mean, warning, right? Because sometimes you change your needle size, you get too much drape right? You go up too high. You keep going up and sure you, now you have gauge, but because of the yarn base that you're using or um, just because of your tension, now it's going to be too loose and too holy. And it's going to look funky too. Like the finished blocked object is going to not, it's not, you know, the stitches aren't going to kind of bloom together in the same way because of maybe the yarn you're using and the needle size that you've ended up with to get gauge. Um, so the opposite effect can happen when you go up too high in the needle sizes. So yeah. Yep. I agree. I mean, I think, um, I think for me, like the takeaway about having gauge on a pattern is it's just like your guidepost for how you want to manipulate this pattern to best fit you, which is like the beauty of knitting, right? So you know mm -hmm. that the designer designed this to be at this particular stitches per inch. Like how do you use that information now to make sure that the garment's going to be a great fit for you. So you, you swatch, right? That's where I feel like that's where you start. Like you swatch. Mm -hmm. I always swatch with the recommended needle size. Um, unless I'm doing something crazy with the yarn, right? But mm -hmm. in general, I'm trying to usually use yarn that's going to be around the same weight, weight as the recommended yarn. So you swatch, right? Start with the recommended needle size, see where you're at. If you're only one stitch off, maybe two stitches off, going up or down a needle size probably will work for you. It's been my yeah. experience. If you're way off, especially though, if there's a lot of ease too. Yeah. That we, especially you know. if you have a lot of ease. And sometimes, you know, sometimes if you're one stitch off and the recommended ease is like five to 10 inches, you might be okay. Mm -hmm. And you can do yeah. the math to figure that out, right? Like you might be okay sometimes. Um, you might be more on the 10 inches, you know, or, or more towards the five, depending on if you're too big or too small, but, but it, it might work out. Okay. So then I think after you, you know, you can, you can sort of manipulate your needle size a little bit, but if, like, as Casey's saying, if you manipulate the, the needle size and then you hate the drape, like you hate the way the fabric looks, that's not going to work. Right. If you love the way that the fabric looks on the recommended needle size, I think the next thing you look at is saying like, okay, here's my gauge at the recommended needle size. Where does that put me in sizing, right? And then you can do the math sort of similar to what Casey's talking about. You look at what your stitches per inch, like, you, you know, you break it down from the four inches to stitches per inch. And then you can look at the total circumference of what that size was supposed to be. So say it's a 40 inch size or whatever, you can divide it out by your stitches per inch and kind of get the idea of what 
your finished place is going to be or like how far off or not you are. And then you can say, well, okay, if I knit it at this gauge with this or, you know, my gauge with these needles and it's going to be 50 inches, like instead of 40 inches, now where do I, like, can I go down a size? Would that come out to be about right? And you can really start to play with it, right? That's, that's sort of the third part of trying to figure out your gauge relative to swatching and relative to getting the garment to fit you the way that you want it to. So I think there's like a multitude of ways that gauge really helps you sort of decipher the pattern because the pattern is there really just to help you and be a guidepost. But ultimately as a knitter, you know, hopefully people feel like they have the freedom and the flexibility to say like, mm, like I kind of, I like this pattern and I would normally knit it here, but I want to knit it in this yarn. And that means that I would have to do, you know, this size instead on these needles, right? I mean, I feel like eventually that's the sort of freedom that you want to have as a, as a knitter, right? It doesn't mean that you have to be a garment designer to do these things, um, but it, it, you know, I think with a little bit of sort of insight into what you're looking at and how to manipulate it, you can really manipulate patterns to fit the way that you want them to. And then if you get really- and Another thing. Oh yeah. Go ahead. I would say if you get really into it, you know, eventually you can um, do, slightly fancier things like add bust darts or add shaping in the waist if you want and things like where it's not written in right that that's where you start to get really specific and that does take I think a little bit more knowledge about maybe how your body fits and like how to manipulate patterns slightly more but this piece of like how do you work with your gauge relative to the patterns gauge I think is something that anybody honestly can figure out okay what were you gonna say sorry Oh, and I was just going to add on to another great resource if you are kind of looking into like maybe you've swatched a few times and you're not getting gauge and you're wondering what's going on. Um, I also like to go to Ravelry and look at other people who have knit the same project yes, and you can, you can filter it to only look at projects with notes because some people, they just knit it. They don't give you any notes, whatever. Um, but the people who take really detailed notes, a lot of them will talk about gauge and how they manipulated the piece to fit them and their, you know, bust size or, you know, they'll tell you what their size is and, and how they played with it to get it. And then you can look at their picture and you can judge, okay, hmm, how do I like their modifications or how they, how they got there? Do I like that? And then, so that actually helped me kind of figure out, um, with my dad's cardigan that it wasn't my tension that was the problem it was I was trying to substitute a yarn and super bulky weight that just was way too light like it was still it was like technically super bulky weight yarn but because it was a different yarn base it wasn't as thick and heavy and dense as the designers was and so I could swatch like 20 times I'm not going to get gauge and if I do it's like it's going to be it's going to look wonky so um, that really helped me just looking at the notes that other people had on Ravelry that had knitted, knitted it before. So, yeah. I think that's smart. I almost always, when I go into a pattern, look at other projects for a couple of reasons. One is that I feel like the designer always has these beautifully styled photos, but they're always beautifully styled, right? So I want to see what it looks mm -hmm. like on everybody else. <laughs> so honestly, In real like, life, yeah. Honestly, I'm like, well, I mean, the designer's yeah, photos are real people. life too, but I mean, like, I want to yeah. see what it looks like when other people make it, when maybe it's not stylized with a professional photographer. That's not always the case mm -hmm. either for every designer, but also mm -hmm. like, what does it look like on a range of bodies? If that isn't like many designers now have a range of bodies in their sort of main piece, but if they don't like, what does it look like on someone who's taller or shorter or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. like, just what does it look like out yeah. in the wild, if you will. Um, I also like to see what people do with yarn coloring like you know for the pressed flower shawl I found as I was looking through that I really like the dark background lighter flower better like I was just drawn to that more so that helped me to pick color choices you know things like that so I like to I like to look at that kind of stuff and then yes people's design notes are really helpful if um if they've needed to take notes I mean a lot of people just knit are able to just knit a pattern straight out and have it fit them and that's great but the people who make modifications or whatever and take really great notes or you've noticed they have a yarn substitution like it called for Aaron and they did DK like what did they do how did they make it different mm -hmm. did they talk about they went up in size they 
they went down a needle set, you know, what did they do? Right. So I feel like all of that is just like, that's one of the great things about Ravelry. If you're able to access it is, um, is that it does have that community piece that, you know, allows us to sort of talk about our knits and how we, how we, how we make them fit us and fit what we do. Right. Um, okay. Somebody did ask a question um, on Instagram. I'm just looking at it here about gauge for sort of heavier or drapier fabrics and, you know, with the weight, if they hang out over time, like kind of how do you get guess gauge for that? I think there's a few answers here and I don't know that I, I don't know that I'm like not the expert on heavy fabrics by any means. <laughs> so if other people have comments, like please shout them out in the comments below and um, give us your thoughts on heavier or uh, fabrics or things like cotton that will pull, like, you know, be um, mm. stretched out over time. I think A, hopefully the designer, if it's something that is really bulky or really heavy is like what they've called for. Oftentimes the designer will already address this in their notes. So that's the first place I would look, uh, especially if it's some sort of a specialty yarn that is really heavy. Um, there's that piece. Uh, sometimes when you have pieces that are really bulky uh, or fabrics that are going to be more stiff, they actually tell you not to block them. And that sometimes can be in the pattern. Yes. Not blocked. Not blocked. Uh, and so that can be because they don't want it to stretch out so much or because it's, you know, already knit in this bulky weight to a specific size. And if you block, it's going to become huge. Right. And so mm -hmm. there are patterns that say like, don't block, or if you really need to do something, it's like a light steam blocking to maybe like get an edge to not curl or something, but there's no wet blocking involved. So a lot of times that helps. And hopefully if that's the type of pattern that they're going to give you an unblocked gauge, with their gauge swatch. And then I think, um, you know, there is some amount of hangout that I, you know, from drapey fabrics that you just can't avoid, right? So uh, depending on the fiber content, actually, sometimes I think you can re-block some of these with a little heat. Um, I definitely know people who have put their, their uh, heavier weight that have hung out like too long now or whatever kind of things like gotten them sort of damp and then put them in the dryer. I know the dryer, dun, dun, dun. Just like, just for a short period of time. <laughs> like yeah, not yeah. Enough that they felt, but, um, but it, especially if it's super wash, right? Like you're supposed to be able to put some super wash in there, but the wool, especially if it's wool and it's heavy, will just kind of like tighten back up a little bit. And so then it can be kind of nice in that sense. So there's that piece too. Um, of, of maybe reblocking pieces of it. But I think it's hard because, you know, there are some yarns and there are some patterns where, you know, the fabric, the fabric maybe is lacy, like it doesn't have a lot of hold to it, the fabric itself. And the yarn that's called for is very heavy, like a cotton, and it is going to have some fallout. And you know, I'm, I'm, especially mm -hmm. with something like cotton that just where the fibers kind of pull and then there's no like heat. wool, you know, has like will shrink up if, with the heat, but cotton won't, it just continues to be heavy. So that's tricky. And if you're going to block things like that, you just have to know that that soaks in so much water. So just being very intentional when you mm -hmm. block it to just block it, like just get it just wet for a short period of time. Don't let it super saturate, squeeze it out really well make sure when you're, you know, carrying it, that it's all contained, you're not letting it just like hang down, you know? And so you're just being really intentional about how you're treating it when it does get wet can be helpful. I don't know. Do you have other thoughts, Casey? Well, yeah, that comes, that loops back to yarn substitution. Yeah. You know, sometimes you think, oh, well, I've got the right yarn weight that the pattern calls for, you know, DK weight or whatever, but you, you've substituted cotton for wool. And, and, and you're not thinking about how that, that yarn base is going to affect, you know, the, the fit and the drape and all of that. And I have a personal example of like my first garment that I knitted in college and uh, it's a vest and it's cute and it has like these adorable little cables on it, but it is so heavy and it just, it's, I don't know if you can tell in the camera here, but it just like, you can kind of see in the neckline how like the weight of the rest of the piece has just pulled it. Um, and this was like my first, you know, it's, it's definitely, you know, you learn from your first, you know, 
live and learn. But um, what I did was I was, I, this was like when I didn't really understand anything about gauge. I didn't swatch. I went, it, all I did was I went into the yarn store and I showed the pattern to, you know, the lady in the shop. And I said, like, can you help me find a good yarn for this? I want this color. Um, and I let her pick it and be in control. But she, I mean, she probably assumed I was going to swatch and do all of this, but um, this is a really dense, heavy yarn. And I just went with what she picked out for me and then I knit it up. And then as soon as I did, I knew like, this is not the yarn they used in the pattern. And if I had done, if I had just used the yarn of, in the pattern, it would have come out very differently. You know, mm -hmm. I think even if, even if I still didn't swatch, like just because the material itself is so heavy. Um, yeah. So, I mean, those are things that, you know, you don't really think about when you're just starting out, but, um, you know, and you might get a wool blend and that's different from like hundred percent wool, right? If it's like blended with cotton or silk or something. So, um, you know, try to, it's fun to play with, I mean, that's one of the, what we've said many times in this show so far is that it's like, that's part of the fun is like getting to play around and pick different yarns and stuff. But when you kind of go rogue, which I like to do oftentimes because I like to find yarn on sale or I'm like, I want this crazy colorway and this pattern doesn't call for anything like that. It calls for like, you know, wooly wool and I'm gonna go with this super wash merino, bouncy, squishy, crazy color or something, you know? So, but all of that, you know, that's why you swatch um, so that you can make those creative decisions. Um, but it does take a little bit more time to think about it than just jumping right in. And a lot of times when you're a new knitter, you just want, you just want to get to that finished object. You just want to get it done so you can wear it. Right. Yep. But it, but taking, <laughs> taking that extra now, time. I'm not like, a new knitter. Right? I still want the finished <laughs> <Yeah>. object. <laughs> the process and once you get into the hang of it then you're like okay well it's almost like ritualistic it's like this is what I do I'm in the swatching I'm in the I'm in the um the swift and winder stage I'm winding the yarn yep. and oh now I'm now I'm swatching the yarn and like you know and then when you finally get to cast on it's like this big moment like so yeah I don't know you can you can have fun with it and make it a ritual and <laughs> yeah I don't know Yes, I agree. You forgot the important picking out the project bag part. <laughs> oh, yes. Part. You should show your new project. You always have the best project bags. That's you have favorite. a whole episode where you show all your project bags. I do have a lot of project bags. If you guys are interested, project bag roundup. I'm, I'm down. Yes. I can do it. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to mention, we did also have um, another question somebody asked, does your gauge change between the body of the sweater and the sleeves? Um, and yes, I think it does for a lot of people. A lot of people knit the sleeves usually tighter than the body of the sweater. And honestly, I think it's for two reasons. Uh, we're, well, we're working in smaller circumference. So right away, I think you're already, however, you know, you're already not as just like, look, I'm knitting. It's like, oh, I'm knitting. You know, it's like tighter. It's like when you're stressed and you're stress knitting. It, like you pull tighter. I think it's kind of it, it lent, the smaller circumference. I think lends itself to something similar. But mm -hmm. on top of that, you're knitting in a different way. So sleeves. Do you have a preferred sleeve method? How do you like to knit your I, sleeves? Because of your recommendation, I use the nine inch cables because I hate working with DPNs and I I hate Magic Loop. So yeah. so that changed my life. I didn't yeah. even know they existed until you told me there were nine inch. Cables. They're so good, you guys. If you so so sleeves, right, or anything small circumference tube, double pointed needles. That used to be the way. Mm -hmm. I've knitted many a thing on double pointed needles. Lots of people love double pointed needles, and more power to them. To me, it feels like a hot mess. Like <laughs> I just want to like throw it. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, and you got your one needle left over and you're like, which needle does this go to now? And like, where did I start? And like, I can't put a mm -hmm. in my stitch marker. Like, yeah, yep. so my double pointed needles are not my favorite. Although I haven't, I've definitely knit on them. They're not my favorite. Um, I hear that the flexi flips are better. I have never used the flexi flips. I will admit. I so tried cool. them, but I'm not a flexi flipper. You know, I tried it once. For those who don't know, it's basically like a set of double pointed needles, but it's got a, like an interchangeable needle 
looking end and like the middle part instead of just being a straight a straight double pointed needle the middle part is like a cable so it's flexible so some people love those I have that I, will, I haven't tried those so maybe I'd like those better um then there's magic loop so the magic loop method for those that don't know is basically putting your tiny circumference uh with like so like if this is the circumference of what you're making you're going to put a cable needle through it that's huge so like the needle sticks out here then the cable goes through here and all the way around and the needle comes out here and so then basically as you're knitting you're going to knit across half the stitches and then like flip it and pull the end of the cable out and then knit across the other half so you're basically knitting like half the circumference flipping the whole apparatus and then knitting half the circumference but it allows you to knit small circumference on a big cable needle so that you don't have to you know you just have the two needles you feel like you're still just knitting like two needles a lot of people love magic loop i magic looped forever because i can't stand double pointed needles the one thing I don't like about Magic Loop is for stockinette, I actually don't mind it at all because you're just knitting. But what I don't like is if you have a pattern, like if you're knitting, um, even if you're doing stockinette color work, I don't love it. But anything like oh, with the a, floats, with the, the floats, floats that right? catch, it's yeah. Annoying because you end up um, basically having, instead of just having the beginning of the round where you have an overlap where there could be something wonky, you basically have that in both like at both ends of your circle right because where you flip it is also a place where you have to really pull tight to try and get there to not be a jagged edge or a weak point there so if you have any sort of a textured knit uh we you know where you're making up a pattern with knits and pearls or cables or brioche like all those things kind of get distorted there or have the potential to get distorted there so for that reason i magic loops maybe my second favorite <laughs> but um for me it's all about the nine inch circumference needles small small circumference mm -hmm. just like a tiny cable the downside of the tiny cable is that the needles the actual needles that you're holding on to are like only two inches long so if you have any problems with like grabbing something small like if that hurts your hands it's probably not the best solution for you you know people like magic loop because you're using a full-size cable so you've got like full-size needles um but for me it's just it seems more seamless like it's smooth can do whatever I do brioche I can do color work what because you're just basically knitting on a tiny cable needle right a tiny circular cable needle so for me it really works and they make um there's great interchangeable sets for those so anyway that's how I mm -hmm. also knit my sleeves um but so talking about gauge so uh, even if you move to a small circumference cable needle from a large cable needle you're still moving down to a small circumference where you're holding on to something tiny or you're doing magic loop, or you're on double points, the methodology in which you've now changed to knit your sweater sleeve versus the sweater itself has completely changed. And so because of that, there's the massive potential for your tension to change, right? And if your tension changes, then your gauge is gonna change. So I do think that it's common for people to have a discrepancy in size between their the body of their sweater and the sleeves of their sweater. And if that's you, <laughs> Um, you know, it's something to just know about how you knit. I know many people that go up a needle size for the sleeves. They just do it. Like even if the pattern doesn't tell them to, they just know that that's what happens for them. So they do it. Um, I know some people do like a little test cuff, you know, they just make like a test few rows in around and then measure that gauge and see what that's like before they pick up the stitches for the sleeves. So I think there's ways around it, but Generally speaking, the people I know who do it always do it. So they always are, you know, thinking ahead or they've already got some sort of fix in place that they've worked with. I don't tend to do it. <clears throat> I try to be really conscious about it. I don't know, Casey, do you change needle sizes or anything for the sleeves? I don't. I mean, I haven't before. I haven't had really an issue with um, sleeve fit like since I've started swatching and now that I understand more about yoke depth and that sort of thing. Yep. And um, I haven't really needed to, but yeah, I know a lot of people do it and it makes mm -hmm. sense. It makes sense. I have knit one pattern where the pattern explicitly told you to go up a needle size for the sleeves. So when you picked up the stitches for the sleeves, I forget, I think the body was on a seven and we went up to an eight. And I will say, I don't know that I noticed a huge difference, but the sleeves definitely fit great you know, on that sweater. So, I mean, I think there's something to just paying attention to what happens with your gauge because it is 
it is one of the points in your garment making where things could shift, right? So I think it's a good, like a good thing to pay attention to. Any final thoughts about Gage? Well, my last final thought, and this is a, like a lessons learned, like from my own mistakes that I want to share with you all is, um, I've heard other knitters and designers say they keep a swatch library is what they call it, and, you know, or they have a, a knitting journal where they are writing down, um, you know, what they swatched, what yarn they used, what needles they used so that they could go back in. And, and so something that Sarah, you and I have talked about before is that like, if you've knit a swatch in that same yarn before, um, for, you know, or for that designer, um, and you save that swatch, you don't really need to swatch again yep. because you've already swatched, right? If it's been the same, well, let's say, so it's gotta be the same needle size. And same yarn. If you've used the same needle and the same yarn, yep. just save those, save those swatches if you really like that yarn um, or that base, or whatever. So um, I have a pile of swatches. I think we have a picture on our Instagram page of like I'm all of, the swatches, right? I have more. Here's my sea glass sea swatch. It really is so pretty. Um, nice. Yeah. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody on Instagram posted like to their stories that it was a Barbie rug, and I really oh, liked that. And then, that's it's so like, cute. Oh, Barbie rug with the <laughs> So cute. Um, but so what I've started doing with um, Jake's hoodie, and I'm gonna do this every time now, is I want to say, and I have a a plastic bag full of the little labels for my yarn because you never know when I need to go back and refer to those. I don't throw those out. If you're throwing those out, that's a bad idea. Save those labels somewhere. Um, so save the label because that'll tell you like the yards per gram and the, you know, the recommended needle sizes, the, you know, the yardage, all of those sorts of things. If you have like a little remnant ball of of this yarn and you don't save this tag and you don't know how many yards you started with it's hard to do the math to figure out how many yards you have left so it's really important to save the tags not just for gauge but you know so I have this swatch here and I have the tag of the yarn but then I also have little note cards that I've pinned on here so I've got you know I, important things to take note of is what needle did you actually knit this with because I have all these swatches and I can look at it and be like okay this is DK weight I, I can look at it and tell but I have no clue what, what needle size I, I used yep. to knit this swatch. So this is basically <laughs> useless now. Maybe it's a hanky if, you know, it's cold season or you know, maybe I'll try to make a quilt out of it. Some people are clever and they use the swatches as uh, pockets. I mean, maybe, maybe not with the fringes because that could unravel. But like, you know, if you've swatched and, you know, stocking it flat and you don't have the fringe, you could make it a pocket for a cardigan or something. So some people save their swatches and use them. But um, they're basically useless unless you keep notes on them. And so you're going to want the needle size written down in your, that you used for the swatch, but you also want to write down your stitches per inch. Um, and you're going to want to write down the, what the pattern called for. And then I also have notes on here when I'm trying to figure out what size to knit, I have um, uh, notes on like what to do next to get the chest measurement I want. Um, so there's a little math in there that I saved. Um, but that's just what I'm going to start doing. Some people are really organized and they have a binder and they use the like um, sheet protectors and they keep their swatches in there so that they, they stay nice and flat and they don't curl up. Because over time, even though this was blocked and it was flat at one point, just because it's been sitting around and it hasn't been sitting flat, it's starting to curl again. So if I wanted to really use this again, I'd have to block it again, maybe wet block it um, again, because it's changed a little bit. Um, some people, I know uh, Selena of Dank Fiber and Woolen Pine Design, she has like a, a wall that she keeps her swatches um, and she pins them up and it's like a little pretty reminder of all of the things that she's designed and she's knit. And so you can make it an art piece, but um, it's really good to keep notes of your swatches so that um, you never know if they're going to come in handy later on. I'm super notorious for not keeping my swatches. It's something I should do. Um, well, I have a pile of them, but they're useless because <laughs> I don't know what needles I used to knit these. Yeah. 
I do. I find that for me, I, I don't keep them because I just don't want the clutter, but, um, mm -hmm. the other piece is that I test knit a lot. So I have notes like all over my tests. Um, I print my test knit so I can like write in the margins, but I also have a very small notebook where I usually write all my tests in. So I always note, like if I got gauge, what the, you know, what the yarn is, what the side needle size is, et cetera. So I feel like for me, that kind of takes the place of keeping all my swatches, but it is nice to like see them all labeled and, you know, a certain aesthetic mm -hmm. that, that I really like. Yeah. Um, so if you have other questions, I feel like we've just like gone on and on about gauge and swatching and things. So if you have other questions, please drop in the comments or if other comments, what's worked for you, what do you do when you um, don't get gauge? You know, do you have tips or tricks that work for you? That would be awesome. Please share those below. We'd love to hear. Um, and if there's lingering questions or if we've stirred up more questions, be happy to delve into some of those too. I want, I mean, not now, but I think we should talk about yarn substitution in the future because it's actually a bigger, like it's kind of a big topic, right? You can't just mm -hmm. be like worsted is worsted is worsted because that's not actually true. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That's a, that's a topic for another day, I think. What are you wearing? Let's talk about that. <laughs> Since we sort of mentioned that you didn't block it. Yeah, so this is the Power Puff Cardi um, by Park Williams of Park and Knit Designs. And um, I was able to get some Malabrigo Rasta on sale, um, which it's so, it's like marshmallowy and dense and I love it. Um, but this is um, apple green and melon. And um, those were, there were not a lot of colorways left. And I thought, okay, well, I guess I'm going with apple <laughs> green <laughs> as my color. It's um, cute. Like yeah, it. thanks. Um, but yeah, I, I swatched and I got gauge, like perfect gauge. And which I feel like is easier to do when you have yarn this bulky because it's like a stitch is a stitch is a stitch like at I mean it's like so thick that it you know I don't know maybe I'm wrong on that but I just I I got perfect gauge and I'm like this is pretty sweet and I didn't block it because the pattern specifically said do not wet block like if you must steam it steam it lightly from like a distance or you can just like spray bottle it you know just to give mm -hmm. it a little but um because this is so heavy and dense. I don't know if you've ever knit with Malabrigo Rasta, any of you guys, but it is so delicious, but so dense that it just, it would be way too heavy to block. Like, and also it would pill up because it's single ply. Like it's basically roving. It's because I, I took my ends, what was left over and I put it in the, um, my hand carters to, to use as a little puff of green to spin up. And it was like, it just de decomposed back into roving. like so yeah. easily with the with the carters I mean so you don't want to you don't want to wash this and get it all pilly and yeah totally but it's yeah. very cute was it fast because it was such a bulky weight I I knit it I think in a week or less that's so thing. awesome I love those yeah. projects they're so satisfying <laughs> I know and a, a lot of friends who are like they see it and they're like oh my gosh, would you knit me this? And you know, that's like for knitters, that's like the annoying question. Like, no, I'm not going to knit you a sweater or a cardigan. No, like, um, but like, this is one of the few things where it's like, well, if you want to pay for the yarn for this, like, it's like delicious on my fingers to knit. With <laughs> like it would be a treat. Like, and if it takes a week to knit someone a sweat, like a cardigan, that this would be like one of the rare things that like, maybe if a friend asked me, I would just because it's like so quick and I yeah. actually really love it. like my favorite, one of my favorite yarns. I like it. It's super cute. Yeah. I'll have to Thanks. make one. You know, some bulky weight sweaters have been on my to-do list. So I'll have to do it. Yeah. Um, I'm wearing my failed trilogy test. <laughs> so the pattern is trilogy um, by Annie Haas of the Spurred Knits. It's not supposed to be a swancho. It's supposed to be more fitted <laughs> like this. <laughs> um, the great thing about this sweater is that it is a really simple, just very straightforward raglan style sweater. And in the pattern, um, she actually, like when she wrote up the pattern, she had made it in three different ways. I think she'd used a straight, I think it's Aaron weight. She'd done like 
DK with mohair maybe, and then like fingering weight held double with something else. So as testers, she really encouraged us to sort of like come up with your own sort of mix of yarns and kind of figure out kind of how you wanted to do it and go from there, which I think is one of the things that got me into trouble when I was gauge swatching was because this is um, fingering held double with Surrey. I think it's Surrey. Um, so it wasn't a combo that she had used. And, and so for me, you know, I, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a very straightforward yarn substitution. Um, it's Sugar Plum Circus, of course. Um, the green is the color called Sea Glass. So there's the Surrey's in Sea Glass and also um, one strand of the fingering. And then the sort of reddish, it's hard to see. So I'm getting any closer. It's like a, it almost looks like cobbler. It's like a berry and then this sort of yellowish color. It was the September Club colorway, which I believe she has now renamed Lips Like Sugar on her site but anyway so it's one strand of that with the sea glass um into the uh both the surrey and another fingering so it's those three held together for the marl this light is kind of blowing it out but it's really really pretty the marl anyway so it's ended up like this baggy oversized swancha which i totally still wear but it's definitely not the trilogy pattern so if you're interested in the pattern you should go look it up <laughs> because it doesn't look like this not really and it's um it's just a very sweet it was really a fun knit because it's it's a very sweet straightforward like I, I like having those knits in my uh you know back pocket sometimes just to be able to like talk and hang out with friends or just you know be at the park and just like hang out with my kid but still be able to knit something that doesn't take up like all my focus so it was a great it was a great one so yeah let's see um I recently went to Do You Knit in New Jersey. Yeah. Um, if you're in the New Jersey, New York area, I totally recommend going if you can. Um, it's a sweetest little shop. Um, and I got to see my friend Ilana, which was really nice. We met at Squam a couple of years ago. So that was really fun to see her. Um, do you want to see what I got? Yes. I maybe bought kind of a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so talking about project bags, I finally got my hand on a Hohe and Co bag. This is the pompous bucket bag um, in the tricolor. Most of them are single color. It's leather, which I love. It's this beautiful, like pebbled leather. It's great, great texture. Um, it's just simple. Like inside, there's no pockets or anything. It's just a bucket. That's my little tiny shawl that I need to work on for our knit along what's hiding in there. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so this is just the regular size one. I would say there's an extra large one too, and it is humongous. Uh, this holds, I mean, there's two skeins of yarn and my project bag, which is, or my project bag, I mean, my notions bag, which is like honking, it's huge uh, in here. And it's like only half full. So it, I mean, you could put maybe a small sweater in here, like a fingering weight mm -hmm. sweater, certainly a shawl. Um, it's that kind of size and it's nice it's really durable cuts leather which I love so I got that my now eight-year-old son went with me and he goes through these phases where he decides that he really likes yarn and is <laughs> gonna buy it for himself um so he picked out some yarn and my dad went with us on this trip and um of course you know grandpa gave my son everything he wanted so told him he could have it all so he got this beautiful I haven't ever actually heard of this um brand Garthenor organic wool um it is a blend of Polworth Romney and Hebridean and it's from South Wales in the Scottish Highlands and Southwest England like all the different sheeps so it's fingering it is ridiculously soft I think that's why my I think that's why my son chose it is because it's so 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 soft um and this color is called marble it's really really beautiful um and then of course <clears throat> he picked ching fiber which have you ever used ching fiber no but it looks like it could glow in the dark yeah right he's really into these <laughs> yeah. like this color is called jazzy um and it's yeah. their classic dk they have such fun um colors but they I just their yarns are just so nice so this is a merino nylon blend um but yeah he picked all these bright colors so he picked this one and then he picked a bunch of moondrake which he told um Ilana that he's going to make a sweater for himself 
How bright is Ooh, yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Right? So this is Moon Drake. Nice <laughs> this is their DK. Um, this color is called Electric Berries. <laughs> As you can see, the light is definitely making it shine a little more neon, but it's it's pretty darn bright. Uh, this one's called Duckling, because it should be. And then this one is hot pink. And then this awesome blue color is just turquoise. But yes, so this is um this is my son's plan <laughs> for a sweater. Although he got home, he said, maybe I'll make a shawl, mom. <laughs> so I don't know. That's it. So that's his, those were his picks. Um, because we were looking at Ching Fiber, of course, I ended up looking at Ching Fiber. And so I got a sweater's quantity of this dreamy color called um, cloud it's like it's like pastel unicorn dream let me see if I can turn there the light was kind of blowing it out it's like dreamy pastel pinks and blues and like green so I got this I like the speckles the little yeah, right. uh dark little yeah dark speckle so I have a sweater's quantity of that which I don't have a pattern in mind for that's rare for me I don't usually do that usually I have something specific in mind and then I buy whatever I need but this I just I couldn't leave that one behind it, it was like um I don't know just like pastel like dreamy ice cream fluffy unicorn yeah like I couldn't, I couldn't leave it behind um and then at the unit they have um they do have their own sort of label it's you la la which is so cute it's dyed for them by someone local um so this is a linen blend so i've been saying that i want to do more blends so this is merino and linen together um this color is it, so the type of yarn um is is it's you lala and it's blossom is their linen blend is the name and this color is called stonewash kind of like a blue again the light is really like blowing it out i don't know keep trying to turn light on anyway um so i got this with the uh, intention of making the kaisa tea which is also by annie haas of this bird knits it just came out uh, i don't know not that long ago and then um another purchase that was with not planned but i just i like buying um you know things that you can't get somewhere else I, i'm always intrigued by that so this is oh, also you yeah. this is their lux twist fingering weight in the color love you Oh, I yes. love that colorway. I know I do too. So this is merino and nylon. I have three of them actually. And so this is another one where I don't have a plan, but um, I love it. And it's like, you know, it's their label, which I loved. Uh, the, oh, the other thing I bought, I told you I bought so much stuff there. The other thing I bought there is Spin Cycle. I really wanted to get their custom colorway. So bad, unicorn. I, for those who haven't seen it, it's like a pinky. It's so pretty. And that's what I wanted, but it sells like hotcakes as soon as they get it in, like it goes right back out. So, um, so I didn't, I didn't get any cause they didn't have any, but, uh, spin cycle, I feel like is one of those things where if you find skeins that you really love, you got to get them because, <clears throat> you know, the same colorway in the next run might not look the same. And so this is their dream state, uh, which is their worsted weight in the colorway close call which does not always look like this. Yeah. It's like yellows and kind of red orange tones with some blue. And um, funny story, I picked up these two and Alana was like, oh, I bought those two. We should do a knit along. And so we were like, okay, we should just do like a casual knit along. So um, another sweater by Annie, lots of disparate knits patterns this episode. Um, she's got a pattern coming out called, I think she's finally going to name it the Nadine. That's the testing name for it. And it's already in testing. And Ilana and I said, oh, we should do that because it's dream state color work all the way through. And it's really beautiful. And so that was going to be our pattern of choice for our mini two-person knit along. And I reached out to Annie just to uh, see if I could get the yarn requirements so that we could make sure, you know, we had all our yarns ready because I think the pattern's releasing uh, later this fall. Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh, that's funny. My friend and I were also just about to cast on like another one because she's like, I want to make another one. And so she's like, what if we just do a little four person along now? So I have more. So now I have more. Um, I actually ended up, I was going to buy two more, um, but Ilana sent me hers, which was so very sweet of her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, nice of so she gave up hers so that I could use 
close call in mine. And then um, I think she's going to use some homespun, which is really exciting. Um, she just recently made another sweater nice. and, and it's gorgeous. So I can't wait to see. I think I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. It's so pretty. Really good. Uh, and uh, so we're doing our own little cal. And I think, I think many people in our little mini cal are using blue as the main color, which is what I'm going to do with this. I'm going to use a uh, sugar plum circus demoiselle. I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. This is beautiful, like medium blue color. That's another one of her colorways that I've been like waiting to find a project for. You know, like I've mentioned before, so I'm really excited to get that. So that will be the first thing on my needles of all my do you knit goodies. But yeah, so yeah. Had a really good time there. Everybody there, of course, is so super sweet. So if you're in the New Jersey area, you should make a trip, go hang out. I was really sad because we only had a day and a half in New York City proper, and I spent most of it showing my son around. We went to you know some sites or whatever, but because of that, we did zero shopping, like none at all. The, there's several places I wanted to go beyond just knitting and I couldn't get anywhere. So I was planning to go to Brooklyn General. I wanted to go to Nitty City, but I, we couldn't get anywhere. So, so, oh well. Next time we'll have to have a longer trip in the city. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So there's my mini stash haul. Yeah. I know. So fun. Yes. Well. I don't, I mean, I do have yarn I could show, but that would, I don't have it like out and ready to show right now. It's like in my little yarn trunk, but I did get some pretty Chrysalis Yarn Co. Uh, yarn. Um, so I will save that to show off next time, but this, it's really, really pretty. I um, just got yarn she, from her for the, um, I did her club, the Mars Club. Mm -hmm. It's so pretty. It's back here in one of these giant boxes um yeah it's so it's so so good her yarn is excellent I'm excited to knit with it mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm going to knit mine for yet but I might I might use it in like a an upcoming design or something I don't know but it's really pretty and I had to have it because she doesn't really do speckles ever and it was in this really lovely blue and I'm like it's mine dibs <laughs> like <laughs> I want this. I'm taking it off the market. That's awesome. I love that. Um, but yeah. Oh. Uh, so our knit along. Yes. Is coming up. So it's August 1st right now, but August 31st is when um, the knit along officially ends and we'll start to um, do prizes and celebrate and show off all of your projects if you've been knitting along with us. We'll kind of absolutely uh, celebrate you. I mine, I've been I need to spend more time on it. Me I'm too, a little behind. I'll show my first because it's really embarrassing. <laughs> it's only this big, you guys. Mine's not much bigger. Yours um, is totally been, bigger. Look at it. It's only, I mean, but oh, that's still, way bigger. Mine's so little. Look, I only have like six little flowers. It's like the size of a little bikini bottom right now. Look, yours is turning out so cute though. I love that. I know I really I really do love it our colors are very Indiana. similar they are you know um, I have a feeling if you got them in person they wouldn't be quite as similar so this right. is brown if you remember it's a dark brown with a light pink peony is the pink and yours mm -hmm. is more of like a like a merlot like a wine color right with gray yep with gray um it's, it does feel really I love the texture of this but so I'm at that point where I feel like I'm halfway through the shawl because I'm half, I've done two of the main repeat of the chart, that, that main chart repeats, I've done two of those. Yes. <laughs> That's not how shells work. You're That's not, not how shells done. work. <laughs> it's like that, every <laughs> time it's like exponentially longer. Yes. And then the last repeat is going to be quite the slog. But I, so I know I'm like really behind and I'm going to catch up. I'm behind but, too, but I also um, will catch up. I have been working on some secret test knits that I unfortunately can't talk about or show you but um those are hopefully done soon so I will <clears throat> be working on our shawl <laughs> how embarrassing yeah. if I don't finish our I know. shawl for our own cow that would be nice. I'm gonna try and like kind of turbo boost this because um I'm going to the renaissance fair next weekend and okay. I really would like to wear it as kind of like a renaissance-y I don't know like a part of my little outfit we're gonna try and dress up um but 
So I have like this week to finish it if I want to do that, but I'm going to use that as a goal. If I meet that goal, that'd be great. But in real life, I don't know. I'm going to well, try. If you meet that goal, we'll have to, you'll have to style it at the fair and we can post pictures on Instagram. Yes. Yep. Uh-huh. So, there's your challenge. <laughs> All right. Sorry, my husband's like barking orders at me in, inside. No, you're good. As husbands do. As husbands do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my friend, I think that's it for this episode. Yeah. You should go celebrate your birthday. <laughs> so yeah. Stuck on Zoom. This is this is part of how I celebrate it though. This is fun. I like it. I like it. Talking about an it. Yeah. Good deal. Well, uh, again, thanks for joining us. Um, if you have enjoyed our content or you're looking forward for more, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below. You can find us on Instagram at Apothecary Knits. Um, and yeah, if you have any comments on Gage or um, tips or tricks that you want to share with our community, we would love to hear. So you can find um, either comment below or on Instagram. We check both and um, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Enjoy your summer knitting. Hopefully, uh, if you are doing the knit along, you are further along than we are. <laughs> <laughs> starting yes. you have a whole month so um I actually just got a message on Instagram earlier today that somebody is just getting ready to cast on which is awesome so please join us um we love to build our community here and we love to see you guys here so thanks so much for yeah. hanging out yeah Until happy knitting time. bye happy knitting bye